enjoying this. Uh, see, this is uh, joint work with uh, more with Chass, and if I get far enough along, there's some parts with Sasha Voronoff. But um, the only thing wrong with these 60th birthdays is, uh, you know, people might get the idea you're not, you know, still, you know, you're past over the hill or something. So I wanted to remind you of this sequence here. So I uh, hope I did him right. 37? Oh, at 37, right, yeah. <laughs> oh, you must know the pattern. Oh, I, I have it here. <laughs> so anyway, the question is, what's the next uh, element in this sequence? What? 61, 61 no. 60, 60 right. Who, who said that? Okay. Oh, you know the... Oh, I know that. <laughs> 60. Oh, I know the Which, that, you know, does that mean 60 is a prime? Or does it mean it's the order of a uh, simple group? These are, the, these are the orders of the simple groups. <laughs> uh, in order, so. Anyway. Maybe it's prime. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. So, so, the title is Strings, Graphs, and Riemann Surfaces. So, first I want to talk about string, I'll say states. Um, so, uh, a lot of us in mathematics study, uh, if we're not studying dynamical systems or algebraic structures, we're probably studying manifolds per se. So, there's an idea from string theory that you should study manifolds by probing them by considering maps of circles closed curves in the, the manifold. So, have some closed curve, I don't, it may, may cross itself. And uh, so, intuitively a string is a closed curve in a manifold. Uh, that's, let's take that to be the definition, I mean the pre-definition. Uh, turns out it's, uh, we want to make a vector space out of these things. So we want to use algebraic topology. And so there's, one has to go through a fair amount of discussion to get this. Uh, so first you, you do something like this. For example, you enhance the structure by imagining there's a point on the string. So enhance it first. And then you can take the standard circle, the standard circle, And then you can start, well, I don't know where you should start. Let's see. I guess you go like that, really. Standard circle. Start here and then start. And let's say I want the string to be directed, too. All right. And then you can start tracing out, say, with the arc length parameterization, this curve. And, it, and if there's places where it crunches or something, you have to say a few things. But just the idea would would be given by that. And you can construct then, of course, a map from the circle. So if you just give yourself this point, and if you have, say, a metric on the manifold, you can build a map of a circle in a canonical way out of that data. So you need this extra point. And so uh, uh, then we can take the space of all these maps. This is called the free loop space. Place all smooth maps. And then we can uh, take its algebraic topology. We can look at like the chains on this space. And then we can look at the homology. And then we can get some vector spaces. And either at this level or this level, this is getting close to what I mean by a string state. Uh, because it'll be an element in a, of a vector space. So it's really a family, if you have a higher dimensional chain, it's really a family of closed curves with these points on them. And then there's another level, of course, where you have to uh, get rid of this parameterization of the string. A, a real string is 
uh, element in the free loop space modulo the possible parentization. So we sort of eventually want to divide by the diffeomorphisms of the circle. So we really want sort of an equivariant, diff S1 equivariant version of this discussion. And that will be a string state. But I'm not going to, right now I'm not going to uh, stop and give more details on more precisely what I mean. But so that's the idea of a string state, some sort of equivariant algebraic topology of the free loop space of a manifold. So this is a string state sort of in M. So we're probing the manifold. Okay. So that's the string. So now the next title is graphs. Okay. <laughs> what? Very well in terms of scale. In terms of what? In terms of what? In terms of time. Oh, okay. Right. Do I use a third of my time now? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. So, uh, now, there's something interesting that uh, already the, the, the interest uh, comes, the, 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 there are lots of cut and paste operations on strings. And first I'm going to talk about it kind of impressionistically and then we'll get back to a more formal statement involving these string states. But let's just say strings and don't worry about what our states are. And that's because if you, you know, if you have a couple of, uh, well, if you have a curve, like even if you have a single curve like this, if it happens to cross itself, for example, you can uh, break this into two, two curves, two, two strings. There's one string, and there's the other, the other string. In fact, you can even use that point as your mark point if you want to, or you could have other mark points. So there's an op if you happen to see a string like that, you could break it into two strings. And, or if you had two strings, and, and they happen to intersect, then you could break it like this, go around this one, and then around that one. Go around this one until you get back to here, and then go around this one until you get back, back to there. So you can combine two strings. <coughs> so, and you can imagine more things. You can imagine a bunch of strings crossing, maybe uh, a little, you could have like th a triple point of intersection, then you could uh, break it open here and you could, choosing some per permutations or some combinatorial de data, you could reconnect the strings like that. So you have lots of cut and paste operations on strings. And that's what this uh, talk is about. Oh, uh, so I should mention there's a beginning paper on this called String Topology with Morbid Chass, which is on the uh, whatever you're supposed to say, on the, on the what, web, net, what do you say? On the what? In the archives. Okay, on the archives, in the archives? Okay, in the archives. If you don't know about the archives, you're not gonna be able to find that. No, I just tell somebody to find it for me. <laughs> <laughs> or ask them, yeah. There's usually people sitting in front of computers who like to do this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote that. No, oh, that's it. I'm one of the authors. <laughs> one of the authors. So I, I know it only too well. All right. Okay. So that, but that's a place where you can read about the, uh, a little bit of this stuff. Okay. Now, again, there are going to be, uh, there are always two levels. There's, there's sort of the first level, which is the loop space level, and then there's the equivariant version of this, which is the string level. So there's always, there are going to be uh, two levels for these operations, and they have a different algebraic structure. Okay, so now... Right, the string is without the parameterization, exactly. So it's like, intuitively, the free loop space mod diff S1 in the domain is the space of strings. But algebraic colleges have a te technical way of doing that because that action has fixed points. So you have to modify the 
thing a little bit. But uh, so the first question is, when we get to graphs now, what is the uh, what is the totality of all um, Actually, do you know what characterizes this prime? No? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's the first irregular prime. Right. Right. Which means? So there are ways of saying it, but the, the way I like to understand it is that it's not a, 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 as a, uh, a the spec of the spec of z over 27 over 37 sitting inside spec z. Uh, we, when you do this on the level of the power cohomology, it's enough. It's it's enough, enough it. the others are, are curved. Well, I think it's, it's sort of related to strings, right? Also, because each prime is something like a string in S3 when they say tall theory. Yeah. Anyway, uh, there's, an, there's an algebraic. Uh, so, uh, but. I don't understand that anymore. But Barry Mazur used to tell me about it in the 60s. So, um, so what is the totality of, of string operations? Uh, so I want to think of having n strings and then some of these cut and paste operations say to n strings. <coughs> um, and so you get a lot of them in the following way. So you, you just abstractly, let's we have n strings. Let's just imagine them abstractly. And then you uh, take any chord diagram, which means just connect these up with, let me, let me draw them a little more solid. Connect these up with uh, some finite collection of, these are called chords. These are bonds or something. And then, uh, you could imagine you, you, that if you had some luck, you could have a collection of strings with parameterized by these circles, and this string would happen to go through, this point of this string would happen to go through this point of this string. Same for here, same for here, same for here, same for here. And then you could do the operation I was talking about. This is, like this means, this, the image of this looks like that. And then you could do the operation using the ori ori orientation and, and do this cutting. So anyway, this, this gives you a, a diagram for potential string operations. So you could just do it abstractly. You could say, take these circles, bring them over close to yourself, cut them at all these points, and just glue them together, reconnect them according to the arrow. So there's an abstract string operation. And uh, I also want to allow. These are, these are sort of the typical ones. Uh, I also want to allow cases where uh, uh, things come together. So you could have uh, chords like this, too. You can have like three things coming together. And, and this would mean you would have three things crossing. In order to perform this, you'd have to have these three points. If you want to bring these three, three things together, so, so like you grab these three places, imagine you, you bring them together. And now you have to decide how you're going to do it, but you, you cut them and then you, you glue them together. So actually, uh, the data you would need, here the operation is uniquely defined given the, the directions. But when you have triple intersections like this, what you have to do is you have to give a cyclic order to the branches of the vertices. So the sort of the general string operation, which is enough for what I want to do, the general string operation is any generalized chord diagram. So it includes, you have M circles, and then you also have chords, but these chords are allowed to come together. So what it, for formally what you have is a, is a N circles, a finite subset on the, on the N circles, and a partition of that finite subset. So this just means an element of the partition. And you have a cyclic order of the uh, finite subset in the, in the one partition element. So if it's a two element subset, there's only one cyclic order. You don't have to give any data. If it's a three element subset, there are two cyclic orders. 
So you have to give this data. Then, given the cyclic order, you bring the three strands together. You bring the, you know, whatever n strands you have, you bring them together and, and place them in front of your eyes in the cyclic order. You cut them, and then you, so they're all, they're all directed like this. And then you cut them and go like that. So it's like, um, so that the strings come together like along these three things and then they, they go out, they come in like this and then they go out like this, you might say, if you think of the operation. Infinitesimally. So if you have the cyclic order, you can do that. Okay, so those are the, those are, so those are going to be realized as uh, operations on these string states in a certain sense. Now there's actually, these string operations actually have parameters because uh, as I said, I wanted this point of this circle to be equal to this point of this circle. So if I move this a little bit to here, that indicates a different string operation. But in algebraic topology, if, if we do this some, at some chain level or something, we got an operation like this, somehow this, these two operations would be chain homotopic because of the, you have the interval of operations in, in between. So for the operations to be defined, you, you're, you have to well, I haven't said, I'm going to say more precisely. Now I just want to give the idea that you're just uh, taking strings, cutting and pasting, and I want to discuss the combinatorics for a moment of the set of cut and paste operations. Assuming appropriate intersections. Yeah, yes, assuming that I'm in this context, which I've suggested, and I employ, I want to employ it in this context, but that's going to be like a, a result, that you can make this happen here. But just now, just imagine it's happening by luck or make it happen by just pulling the strings together and doing it. Just to, in other words, these are labels for the operations that are going to be defined precisely later. So we have a bunch of morphisms, so to speak, from here to here. So you're supposed to think of something, but don't say it. Don't say it, don't say the word. <laughs> oh, you can say the word, I guess. But. So there's a space, uh, there's actually, there are parameters in these operations, because this is going to be geometric, there are parameters, so we actually have a space of all such uh, generalized chord diagrams. See, they naturally fit together uh, because, for example, this, this triple intersection here is really very close to this chord diagram. So this, this chord diagram, when these two points come together, this converges to the tr tr triple point uh, operation. And in fact, if you look at it closely, you actually get it when, you, two, when two chords come together, a cyclic orientation is implied by this. So there's a natural one, in fact. So in fact, even though the chords, the typical ones, don't need cyclic orientations, when they collide, these things inherit cyclic orientations. You can check that. Uh, anyway, so all these different, so you have each combinatorial picture has a certain number of parameters. The number of parameters is twice the number of chords because each chord has two parameters, but when they collide like this, then you have one fewer points, so you have one fewer parameters. So this is like on the boundary, this is like a cell, something like a cell, and, uh, and, and when the the combinatorics of the diagram changes, you're sort of going to the boundary of the cell in the space of these operations. You have one fewer parameters. It's not quite a cell. It's really a, a torus cross a cell because, uh, you know, like the first, you know, if you imagine, well, one, one point can, can ro rotate around, so you have like a circle, but it, well, once you know where one point of the configuration is in each circle, then the choice of all the rest forms a contractible set. So it forms a cell. If you, if you know where, you know, this one point is fixed, and this is fixed, then when you, wherever you put the other points, this defines a cell, an open cell, product of intervals. 
it's not a product of well, it's a simplex. Anyway, so there's a space of uh, these chord diagrams, a space of these cut and paste operations, and it has components. So that um, maybe I'll go back over here. Let me keep my paper in front of me so I can make sure I'm going at a good enough speed. So we have components of these geometric chord diagrams. And uh, the components are more or less labeled by uh, the number of input circles. And then when you perform the operation, you get a certain number of output circles. It depends, called M, say. It depends on the, uh, in a in sort of a complicated way, on the, the actual combinatorics of the diagram, the cyclic orders you chose, and the number of uh, chords you have down, the number of pieces. So actually, I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going to, uh, well, OK. Um, uh, so one of these top cells, let's say, are, they'll be in, a, they'll be in a, a component of this whole space that all fit together. The component is determined by these three, these three parameters. These are three free parameters. <coughs> and I, I want to have at least one chord. OK, so. Uh, now, you can compose string operations. If I sort of have an operation or a family of operations, uh, I can perform the operation. I'll get M strings. And then if you give me another family of operations, I can take those M strings and cut them up and re-glue them together. So I have a composition structure on these. So, uh, so we can sort of define a what you might call the I'm going to put quotes here because I have to sort of say it in two forms the string prop <coughs> so uh, this prop this was word was uh, introduced yesterday in uh, Sasha's lecture and uh, I don't want to reiterate the definition but uh, just it's going to be uh, uh, for each N and M, you have a set of morphisms. You can compose them. You have the action of the symmetric group. You have a associative law. Though those are the things he wrote down for the axioms. So it's, it looks like you need to know the explicit parameterization of the string. To, yes. And, and I'm wondering how you get that uh, after you've done one of these operations. Because of the mimetric. But See, the, when you have but the loops can come out of length different than one, right? After you yeah. Do. Yeah. So right. Then you right. It so one. If you want to, but you don't, you know, you don't really have to. I mean, the real point is the mark point because there's a unique way to parameterize just given the metric up to scale. But, and I'm going to discuss that mark point in a second. So to actually, uh, you, you, yeah, so there's a little problem here. You can't actually compose these uh, operations. If I have M strings over here in a new chord diagram, I can't actually, and I get these other strings coming out. As Kurt pointed out, they have different sizes and so on. And I have them labeled, one through N, one through M, one through M, one through N. Then I have to sort of, this is like the thing I have over here is a template. I want to impose it on the other one. So I have to know how to twist them on. I just don't you know, put them on any way. I have to put them on a certain way. So in fact, there'll be two discussions with mark points and with arc mark, arc, without mark points. But I'm going to discuss that now. So there's a little ambiguity there, which you should be aware of, that has to be dealt with one way or the other. Two ways to deal with it. Yeah, if you do, you do. And if you don't, you I'm going to do something. I'm going to get around it, though. There's a way to get around it That's by uh, algebraic topology. Uh, uh, so this is the string prop sort of exists potentially at three levels, at the level of spaces, or I'll just call it cell complexes, because these spaces naturally come divided into cells. At the level of chain complexes, where you think of the cells as not being geometric, but just as generators of of a vector space with a boundary operator that tells you roughly how they fit together. Or then you can take homology. The homology spaces, say with 
Q coefficients or something. You take the homology of these spaces and, and you can actually work. So that actually you can have a prop potentially at three levels. Now, <clears throat> so first with, um, with, um, at, with mark points, so if you augment the discussion by every circle, every string has as part of its structure a mark point. And every output string has as part of its structure a mark point. Not necessarily the ones you see from the construction. It's just part of the structure. Then you can apply these things to these things with mark points. And the mark points that, that you get on the output is additional structure you have to make. It's part of the operation, you might say. And so then you could have an actual prop at this level. You start with something with mark points, you do the string operation, you get this new thing that doesn't have any mark points, you give it mark points. And that's the operation. And so that's on the level of cell complexes. And then the cell complexes then involve, they're bigger dimensional now because you, part of the operation is the data of these phases, so you're crossing with an N torus or an M torus. So that's if the cell complex changes slightly when you have mark points. And then you have no mark points. Oh, so then if you have this, then you can apply chains, and you have this, and then you can take homology, and you also have this. Now, if you have no mark points, if you want to try to do something on strings without the mark points, then uh, you don't have, at the level of spaces, but this is a wonderful thing. You do have it at the level of chain complexes. Because what you do is, you say, suppose I have a family of strings and an operation I want to do. Then I, uh, I take all realizations of, of the thing with all, all the rotations. So you get sort of a torus family. And then you get your output is some other strings. And then again, you take all realizations, you take all possible choices of markings to, to compose. So, uh, uh, so what happens is, is that you also have it at this level and, th and this level without the mark points. Uh, this will be uh, clearer. Uh, uh, this will be very clear in a moment when I get to the relationship to Riemann surfaces. So let me I'll say more now about that. So there's something about, uh, without mark points, this is sort of algebraically more complicated, uh, but it, it, and it has quite different features because you have to sort of put this torus in and take it out by, by equivariance. OK. so. But anyway, we can state, so let's call this the, whichever one we're talking about, or, or let's, let's say, let's call this cell complex the string prop, S and M. <coughs> and then, so I'd like to know, <coughs> I'm really interested in the algebraic topology of this. Uh, let's see. Uh, The dimension of this thing is uh, roughly two times the number of chords. Or if you have mark points, you have to add in, 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 in those parameters as well. Uh, so I've got a theorem. Let's see. Right. So, so I guess maybe one should, I mean, just to be more precise, let's call the props we get in this line, maybe to call these the, the loop loop props, and this is the string prop. They're not the same. So we have sort of five of them. And you know what little level we're in. Ugh. Okay. So now I want to state a theorem about the uh, algebraic topology of this. So this, um, I'm going to say what the, the string prop is. So the S and M space, this is the space of the prop, space, the space of these diagrams. The claim, the theorem is that this is a deformation retract of 
the uh, Riemann moduli space, MGS. I'm, I'm kind of using the notation that I saw in Haar's paper, and I noticed Bob Penner talked to him yesterday, used this same notation. So S is like the number of punctures or holes. I'm going to use them kind of interchangeably today. So S is N plus M, uh, where S is N plus M. <coughs> and it's completed. It's not just this moduli space. It's, uh, this is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces with genus G and with S marked points on it or marked holes. If I'm not talking about it up to deformation retract, there's no difference between having a, a hole removed or a point removed for the space. Uh, the homotopy type of the space, so I won't make that distinction. And this is, uh, I'm calling it NM completed. And I'll, I'll say what this means. So we're going to take the moduli space and we're going to complete it with respect to combinatorial consideration. Uh, according to the splitting of S, we call S is N plus M. What? Ah, G. What is G? Very good. Uh, well, the, what's, what's, so this is the third word in the talk. Is, uh, so these are like, well, uh, actually, these are not quite graphs. These, but if you, uh, the graphs that I was thinking of, or, well, they're sort of these. These are graphs, I guess. But also, the, the other graphs you can get is take the circles and actually collapse these chords. And then you get, uh, you know, the, each circle gets glued up in some way, and then the other circles get glued to it. And I don't know this. You get some when you glue up these circles. You get some graphs like this, which have even valence. These. This is sort of chord diagram one, and uh, and then um, you can actually take this graph and thicken it up. And you can actually associate uh, to one of these core diagrams a ribbon surface. So locally, you, you, what you, the way, the way to think about this is below the blackboard, take each circle and push it in slightly. Put a c c cylinder that sticks into the blackboard, into the blackboard, and then coming out of the blackboard, you, you construct for each chord a little one handle. Like, like this. So the drawing in, in relief would be, uh, so here would be your string. And if you had a chord, so you go below the blackboard and put this. And then if you have a chord going like this, you put a little strip across like that. And then you put lots of little strips and so on. And then the nice thing is, you see, when these things come together like this, when this thing pulls over to here and, and these things come together, this can slide out, to, this strip can sort of go out to there, topologically. The genus doesn't change. So the genus is the genus of this surface that you get. By thickening up this figure, when it's chords like this is a natural way to do it, and then when you have these multi-chords like this, you use the cyclic order to thicken it up. And so the, so associated to any one of these figures, you have a surface with boundary. And on the boundary is naturally divided into the part below the blackboard, which had n circles, and then some number, m circles, above the blackboard. That's where the m comes from. So the m is determined implicitly by the diagram and the cyclic orders. And then the genus is also determined implicitly. And there's a little relationship between them, simple relationship just by counting the Euler characteristic. You can check this. Uh, uh, the Euler characteristic of the surface uh, with boundary, it deformation retracts down to this drawing. And the Euler characteristic of a bunch of circles is zero. Each time you add an arc, you're adding an edge. 
So you're subtracting one from the Euler characteristic, so you get the Euler characteristic, and then if you get the surface and you stick in cells on all the boundaries, n plus m cells, you have some surface of genus G. So its Euler characteristic is 2 minus 2G. Two you put all that together, so you get minus the number of chords plus n plus m. This is the Euler characteristic with the chords. This is adding on the two cells. This is 2 minus 2G. Two so that's how. So <clears throat> the components are determined by uh, n, m, and chi, but you can also determine the components by, by n, m, and g by this equation. So this, each string operation and each component is, is associated to a, a Riemann surface of genus G, which has n preferred boundary components and m preferred boundary components, the inputs and the outputs. And then as you vary all these around, you're getting a space and this statement is that this space contains the moduli space, but there's a little completion going on. But the completion depends on the splitting of things into inputs and outputs. And the criterion is to, uh, let me say, maybe I'll just start giving the, the proof and then let the proof give the statement. Is it S, M, M number? <coughs> What? Do you fix the number of chords on the left-hand side in your theorem? No. But the right-hand side depends on Oh, oh yeah, well, I do, yeah. It, uh, yeah, it does, yeah. I fix, it's, it's determined by this. Right. So, so the left-hand side is S, N, M number? Oh. Well, it has components. Sorry, you're right, yeah. Uh, direct sum over, over the Gs. Like this, if you like. Okay, or you put it on this side. You can put a G here if you want to. Yeah. Maybe that's been better. I don't know. The, for each N and M, you have a countable set of components. As the genus goes up, you, get, you have genus zero, the first component, and then genus one, genus two, genus three. Um, So I thought I would uh, save time to uh, just start giving the proof. The proof is very, very, um, at least, uh, it's very um, helpful or illuminating in a way. So let me sketch the proof. And the proof will say which completion I'm doing. So you. Uh, Better to start on the right-hand side, uh, and then get something going over here. And then you have to see that there's a completion going on in the right and on, on, on each side. So this sort of this space will map into certain open set in there, and then you have to complete both sides to make it work. So uh, the, so the idea is the following. So take any Riemann surface and it, with uh, uh, genus G and uh, S holes, where S is N plus M, but use the fact that, you, you, that they're labeled and there's, there's N of them that are picked out and M of them that are picked out, and put the, the, ones, the, N, the N ones on the left and the M ones on the right. <coughs> and let's say you, this is a Riemann service here. Now, th there are a couple of things here. You could put infinite cylinders on here conformally, and then you'd be talking about a Riemann surface with n plus m punctures conformally. But up to homotopy type, that doesn't, doesn't matter how you make this. Let, 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 let me think of having chosen this contractible extra data of choosing a whole size. You can do this by taking a hyperbolic metric, choosing a whole horror cycle around that's called the decoration in the, in, in the work of Penner. Anyway, it's contractible data. So I won't worry about that distinction. And then you take a harmonic function, since I have to the unit interval. So it has the value 0 here and 1 here. So there exists a harmonic function. The value of the harmonic function is the probability that a random path will exit the boundary on the right, I think. Yeah. Anyway, that's the harmonic function. And then you look at the levels. So this will be, you know, near the boundary here, it'll be 
you know, just constant function that goes up. It looks like X near, near the boundary here. The levels will look like this near here, and over here they'll look like this. Well, let me draw this in a little bit. <clears throat> it's a harmonic, oh, the definition that I gave? The definition is for any point, take a, a, a random path starting at this point, it'll eventually hit the boundary because it's bouncing around, and you take the probability that it goes out this side. All right. And that's harmonic because uh, in order to leave, you have to first get to the boundary of a small disk, and then the probability that, it, uh, that you start here and get to there, averaged over these things, is the probability from the center. That's the proof that it's harmonic. Anyway, assuming that it's defined. Huh? Oh, this is a conformal, I said a Riemann service. When I say Riemann service, I mean Riemann service. I've noticed in this seminar that people use the word when they don't mean it. But, you know, they just mean surface. But Riemann surface means a, you know, I was talking about the tight motor space and the cusp and all that a minute ago. Okay. <laughs> and the moduli space up there. And I started with a the point there. <clears throat> and I said harmonic function. Uh, maybe I didn't say I was assuming I had a Riemann surface, though. Well, uh, okay, so then, and then, uh, this will be a nice, sort of, not quite a Morse function, but it'll be almost a Morse function. It'll be a ton of a, a Morse function with, you'll have some singularities. The picture I've drawn, it looks like it's actually going to be a Morse function. There'll be critical level here, and then there'll be one here, and, and so you get this foliation of the Riemann surface, and you see the string operation right in front of your eyes. You see, you just hear the circles come in, they just go along the levels, they get to a critical point, they combine, get to another critical, and there's one circle, they get to a critical point again, then they break apart, and so on. So you see a sort of a composition of string uh, operations anyway. So, uh, uh, so the, you know, the idea of this, so let's think of associating to this Riemann surface, this composition. So you actually have to look at orthogonal trajectories and all that, composition of these string operations, which will be again a string operation because these things are closed under cutting and pasting and cutting, like if you cut and paste and then you cut and paste again, that could be thought of as one cut and paste. Composition of string operations is a string operation. And the idea is that if you look at the structure of this Riemann surface, analytically, conformally, you can build it, you can think of it geometrically like this. You have, uh, you have these, you, you can put on a, conformal metric so it looks like a straight cylinder until it gets to the critical level. You have a couple of straight c c c cylinders and then you decide some way, you know, rolling one cylinder around the other, you decide where you're going to attach them and then this comes off as a straight cylinder to here and then up to this level and then it, and then you, just, you have the straight cylinder going along and then you decide, you choose a pair of points, and this is the moduli of the Riemann surface is telling you exactly where these points are, how far apart they are proportionally to the whole circle, and where they are relative to something else here, because you have orthogonal lines. You know, the points, the points of all these circles, all the mass of these circles are canonically identified by the orthogonal lines, and it's length preserving, it's, it's area preserving as you move across here, length preserving transversely area preserving, which is length preserving. And then you get to here and two points, the Riemann surface tells you which two points uh, you're supposed to do and then you break them apart and then you go to here. Oh, I missed one. There's one here, straight cylinders, and then it's to here and then, then what happens? Um, then it breaks into one again. And breaks into two again, and then this breaks into two, 
And this just goes on straight. So you see the data. What's the data? So if you take the Riemann surface uh, and you look at sort of straighten it out with this harmonic function, this is the sort of the square root of doing the analogous thing with the quadratic differential. This is sort of like a holomorphic one form here. D of the harmonic function is the real part of a holomorphic one form. Possibly multi-valued, but anyway, uh, no, it's not multi-valued. The one form is not multi-valued, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me, okay, let, sorry. Yeah, there's a left and a right. There's an order, order in all, all the zeros are even. So it's oriented, so it's really a one form, not a quadratic form. Yeah? Well, why is the complex structure brought into the discussion to start with? I mean, what? Why is the complex structure brought into the discussion to start with? Because I want to prove this theorem. This is the space of all, the space of all, uh, maybe I should, didn't, I, I, I meant to say, this is the space of all complex structures on the surface of genus G with S holes. That's what this space is. Well, no, because I need to know, I need a metric in order to have the orthogonals because I want to relate the, I want to, the strings are physically moving along. There's a correspondence. You see, when you do a string operation, the material of the string always is the same. You're just cutting up and it's all identified. It's the same material. So this material is being pushed along by the orthogonal trajectories. That needs the conformal structure or the metric. But you only need the conformal structure. And uh, so you see, but so I'm sort of saying, let's take apart the uh, information in, in the conformal structure of the Riemann surface with this harmonic function, given this splitting of the boundaries. You see you've got all these cylinders. The lengths of the cylinders is a contractible parameter. You see, there's just these various lengths. They can shrink to zero, I don't care doesn't matter. And then the, these critical levels would be united in some way. And then they'd have a more complicated critical level, which would be like a critical level, a very complicated critical level might look like <coughs> this. This could very well be a critical level, a Morse function of this kind. All critical, harmonic functions all look like the zeros of a harmonic function. The critical levels all look like that because it's the real part of a holomorphic function. The zero of a holomorphic function looks like z, this is z cubed. So, uh, well anyway, that's the sketch of the proof. The, uh, the information, the topology is sort of like the usual thing. Uh, the topology is often in the phase information. The radius information is contractible, right? So the phase information in the Riemann surface is the string operation, the cut and paste operation on the string. And so there's a, okay, but now let's get to the, this is a non-compact space, and this thing is a compact space, right? So there's some compactification going on. So uh, what can happen, for example, is that this, if you're going along here, let's just reconsider this in an extreme case. Suppose it splits like this, and then it goes along, and then it recombines. I have to draw it down like this just so we can see it better. And then, and then this goes on like this. In other words, in other words, when the circle decided to split, it just split off a very tiny little bit like that. And then this came off as a very tiny tube, and this came off as a big tube. Sort of in the limit, this this will be a line. So. And, but we know what this means. This is the usual way we compactify. There's a, there's a natural way we compactify where we shrink a curve on a Riemann surface to a point or a collection of curves. So these exactly correspond to these uh, degeneracies here. But, and the, but there's a rule that, that N and M have to be respected. Uh, something about N and M has to be respected so the, the NM completion is, <clears throat> in general, you take a curve when you, there's this great thing called M bar GS, which is, you know, this beautiful complex compact orbifold, essentially a manifold, which is obtained by taking the MGS and taking, uh, 
Now I'm going to draw it in the usual way where I think of the inputs and outputs as just being punctures. You just take curve collections, any, any set of curve collections, any curve collection which simple curves, uh, uh, dis, you know, disjoint, not homotopic, and uh, not peripheral, not, not going around like that. And then you, the, you let the complex structure pinch these curves to a point, and that will be one of the, and then you'll get a lower dimensional Teichmuller space. When, like, when this curve pinches to a point, you, you get something that looks like that, and then you get this handle here, and then the rest of it over here. And then you just break this apart. You get a lower genus with two marked points on it. And that's a lower Teichmuller space, an M G minus 1 S plus 2. And that lives out on the ideal in the compactification. So this, when you go out to infinity in, in MGS, in that way, you put this Teichmuller space there. It's sort of like you're going out to infinity. It's like going, infinity is like the puncture in the unit disk. You put in this point and crossed with this lower dimensional Teichmuller space. That's the way it looks. And, and, then, and then you have, for each individual curve, you have one like this. And then if you collapse two simultaneously, these co-dimension two things could intersect and cross like that. So there's a very beautiful picture of this, of the full completion. And I'm just going to use part of it, the NM part, which is, I'm going to draw my picture again in the other way. So you can only, it's sort of like I want to respect the prop thing. So I can like take a curve, I can take, well any curve that doesn't separate is okay. Any curve collection, which if it separates, then I want to have uh, an input and an output in, that, in each component. So any, if any curve collection separates, there has to be an input hole and an output hole in each component of the complement. That's the condition on the curve collection. You only collapse those. And that, see, that's exactly what, what happens here. Well, here's one that doesn't separate, but you could also have another string operation going along. And you could have like something being a small guy being born here and then going off and combining with this might be some other stuff. Something with a small guy could be born here and then it could decide to combine with these other guys. And then if you collapse this curve, this would separate the Riemann surface. But notice there are inputs and outputs on this component and inputs and outputs in this component. So the, so the full statement, if you just examine this picture and when you let the string operations degenerate and you just examine these little things that are created, you just see them as little tubes that appear that have this combinatorial property. So you just, that's the idea of the proof. So you, we actually have then a bunch of, uh, a doubly indexed family of completed moduli spaces and their homologies are the relevant uh, ones for this, these props. And you either put toruses you either add mark points and there's an extra torus and there's a torus action and so on depending on whether you're doing the unmarked or marked level but that part is relatively easy to add to get these are the basic spaces so I'm going to give them a name I'm tired of writing this I think this is sort of okay just call it M bar G but put N M here so instead of writing M bar G S, which is the usual notation for the full thing, you put M G N M like that. And that's what I mean. So always N and M are positive. So I never get the full completion. So these are other these are newer spaces. Okay. <gasps> Okay, so then, uh, okay, so that's um, just one little nice thing is that, uh, is that you, uh, you can use this idea to sort of see what the dimension of this 
space is because if you compute, um, you know, the number of parameters is twice the number of chords, and that was equal to 2g minus 2 plus s. If that's the formula I had before. And then if, times 2. And so that's equal to 4g minus 4 plus 2s. And so if you, if you just had s here, that would actually be the homological dimension of this space. And so I have s extra parameters because I still have the lengths of the individual strings. Those are my s extra parameters. So this, this construction actually sort of finds the, quickly finds the, uh, given that you know the answer, the, the homological dimension of that space. This space has dimension 60 minus 6, but its homological dimension uh, is lower. Anyway, so then there's, uh, I guess, the, there's another theorem, getting back to, I'll stay, state that, and that'll be the end of this. Um, so we had, yesterday, we had the notion of a prop. So these are props, and they have, oh, so we, one doesn't know the uh, homology of these spaces. However, my, my hope is that seeing all these spaces as part of this big algebraic viewpoint will help you understand what the meanings of these the topology of these spaces are, because they're really exactly just cut and paste string operations. So they're sort of fundamental things. Uh, so, um, so the theorem, and so we had also yesterday the notion of an algebra over prop, so that means that there's a vector space, which you think of the elements of the vector space as being the string states, um, in this case, on which the uh, the prop should act. So the uh, so then so if we do say marked strings, so that means we have to augment this theorem by marking, putting marking points on the boundary, and and so on. Uh, then we get that the uh, if an M is a smooth manifold. then the homology of the free loop space of M uh, is an algebra over the marked string prop, or loop, I guess I called it loop prop, yeah, you know, I could call it marked string prop. So uh, in this paper that I mentioned at the beginning, if, if, if one just looks at the operation of just, in there it's basically discussed the, the operation of just gluing two strings together, and this turns out to be a new ring structure on the homology of the space. See, this doesn't normally have a ring structure. I mean, it doesn't have a ring structure. I mean, for a general space, when it's a manifold, it has a ring structure, and, and then this paper is basically about that. It's, it's commutative, but it's, it's not infinitely commutative. If you, you look at the homotopy that makes it commutative and symmetrize that, you get a, an interesting bracket. It has an interesting structure, and it fits very well with the algebraic discussion of Segan's talk about non-commutative differential geometry. And the loop space, he mentioned, I think, there's something that the loop space and the Hoxwell complex related. Anyway, this is sort of a, a big prop that's living in the homology of this loop space was a geometric analog of this algebraic thing. Uh, anyway, so what's the sketch of the proof? This is what Adam was asking about at the beginning. Let me just say that and that will be the end. So the, so the proof is transversality. Well, that's kind of a joke from the 60s. I mean, we used to, Elmar used to tell us that, and it was true, the secret of the manifold is in its transversality. And uh, people used to think I made that up, and I was inventing Vivek Kemper just so I could make such a statement. But, you know, anyway, I'm just continuing with following his advice. Transversality is the secret of the manifold. So, so we're probing the manifold, and all these operations just come out of a simple application of transversality. Uh, namely, you, 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 
so we, first we, we actually go to, this is a corollary, there's actually something at the chain level, which is too technical for me to state. I need to talk about the, given a prop, there's something called the P-infinity version of the prop and all that, but I don't want to talk about all that. But uh, so the idea is, let's just, so, so take a couple of cycles in here, or take a, suppose we have a, let's just do a, suppose we, let's do a, a Mark string homology prop. So it's the, it's the homology, the homology of all these spaces, which I've shown is the homology of these completed modified spaces, acts on the homology of the free loop space. So let me just do, like, let it, an element of H0 act as it's just a component. So let's just choose a component. So you would, a component would, could be determined by choosing a top cell to just draw a diagram, some chord diagram that represents the component, the zero cycle. And then you take families, this is not an integral, this is like another parameter space. You take cycles, take n cycles, n cycles in the free loop space. So n cycles, so the homology classes are cycles in here. So a cycle, like a one cycle would be at every point you would have a loop, a mapping of the circle into the manifold. And then you take, the, you take all these families of cycles, you take their Cartesian product, and then you, uh, over each point of the Cartesian product, then you have n circles in the manifold, mapping into the manifold. So you look at the locus where this point equals that point, these two points are equal, 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 these two points are equal. These two points are equal. Look at the sort of transversal locus. You write that as an equation you move the cycle slightly to make them transversal and you, to the various diagonals that you want and then you look at the locus, that'll be a sub-cycle of the product cycle and then on that sub-cycle all of these coincidences will take place and you can perform the cut and paste operation. And then you can also do this with families uh, to define it in higher dimensions. So that's how you start proving this theorem. So it's, it's easy. No, it's gone. No, no, see the labels, this was a calculation. I brought in Riemann surfaces, they were only brought in. The idea is that the, is the string operation is itself a Riemann surface, a very thin one, where you, you know, you actually put very short, if you almost zero things, you, there's a very short Riemann surface, you might say, but you can make it longer or not, that's contractible. And the string operation, so you start from a homology class here, which you can think of over here if you want to, uh, and you have this family of Riemann surfaces, and for each point in the family you perform, you take a set of string states. A string state is an element in the homology of the free loop space. That's a string state. And then you apply this cut and paste operation to these different states, these homology classes. So you have these families of string. The first string runs through a 10-dimensional cycle, the next one 20-dimensional cycle, a 3-dimensional cycle, 17-dimensional cycle, and so on. And you're in a 16-dimensional manifold, a 4-dimensional manifold, 3-dimensional manifold. You map these in and you, by transversality, cut, cut, cut. You make all these points be equal and then you glue them together. So, uh, Yeah, if you were doing H0, so what it would be, if you were doing it, if I'm doing it in H0, if I chose a different string operation, they would be connected by a path. Oh, that's complex structures. And then this operation, I would perform it one way, I'd perform it the other way, and there would be a homology, I would perform it for the whole path, and that would give me a homology between the two results. So you, and then you have homologies of homologies. So you make the whole cell complex act on this by adding the parameters of the operation. So, so I, if I have just one thing, it's, it's, I write a specific set of equations, but if I have a family of things, my equations have parameters in them, so they're extra variables, so you get more solutions 
the locus goes up, and you get a bigger solution space, which gives you these higher homotopies, if you want to think of it that way. But anyway, it's really just transversality and, and then do, and then we reduce, by transverse, by transversality we are reduced to above. That's, that's the sketch of the proof. Um, anyway, so the Riemann surfaces are, are just there. I, you know, I could have given this talk without saying the word Riemann surface. I said, here is the set of string operations, these diagrams. They, they act on the loop space. But gee, what are these complexes? They're hard, kind of hard to calculate. And then you can, you can and this is just identifying them for you. These, these complexes here, these are the things that act but they're just equivalent to these other complexes. And it's not just a funny equivalence. The actual operation, you see, when you, when you can actually, on the locus where these things are equal, you can build that little Riemann surface inside. So in fact, you can, you can so to speak, realize the harmonic function. You could take the, you, if you want to look at it from the point of view of the Riemann surface, you, here's your manifold M. It has these families of strings in it. And on this locus, these points can be identified. So the, the, the Riemann surface that you actually build can actually be embedded, I mean, or mapped into the manifold cross I. So the Riemann surface really is performing the string operation for you, and it's living in the space. And you can actually put a, you could, you could map it in into the manifold by the construction, and then you could use the harmonic function for this coordinate. So you could actually physically realize the Riemann surface and then you could start doing, if, if you wanted to, you know, this is, a, this is really a background theory. There's no dynamics. I'm not using these cylinders. But you could imagine what Kenji was doing yesterday. He was doing this yesterday. He was moving these things by the gradient of this Morse function. And then when he, then when he got to here, he did some, solved some infinite dimensional PDE to put them together. And then he moved it by the gradient again. That was what he was doing in his talk. So you could imagine in more geometric discussions that you would, this is just topology. It's like just transversality. It's like homology theory. But you can imagine in, in other discussions, you could use these other parameters and combine this with some, uh, some dynamics. But that, I, I don't, I've never seen anybody do it till Kenji was doing it today. Anyway, so, thank you.